Before I introduce the Premier, Jay Weatherall, I want to just make a few comments in terms of why we have a GARA narration. Um, it is a, always an important feature of an IPA conference and has been for a very long time. Robert Garam was born in 1867. He had a fairly impressive list of achievements and it is in fact a conceit of every generation that current challenges are always the most complex and the most novel. But even a brief study of Garam's working life shatters that illusion pretty quickly. After an early career as a lawyer, Garam became deeply involved in attempts to bring six separate states together in a single nation, a topic we've already talked about today. Garam was the secretary to the drafting committee of the Federal Con Convention of 1897 to 98, which ultimately produced the draft constitution and became the founding document for Australia. On the 1st of January 1901, Garam became secretary of the newly formed Attorney General's Department and the Parliamentary Draft Person and the Solicitor General. He was famously the first and briefly the only Commonwealth public servant in Australia. Garam was also responsible for establishing the first Commonwealth Government Departments, the first Government Parliament elected without a federal election law, and designing legislation for the administration of defence, customs, the public service, postal and telegraph service, parliamentary elections, and the federal judicial system. It's also worth remembering that Garan's career covered an extraordinary period in world history, which included the financial crisis of the 1890s, the emergence of the global economy, rising tension between international superpowers, World War I, the Great Depression and the establishment of the League of Nations which ultimately became the UN. Garan served as the Secretary of the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department under 10 Prime Ministers. That included five Prime Ministers in the first 10 years after Federation, which again gives him a distinctly modern connection. Garan's influence remains strong in the Commonwealth Public Service and throughout Australia today, and I recently chaired a series um, for the Commonwealth Attorney General's part, a part of their strategy session. So he remains relevant and considerate in terms of informing and encouraging debate, discussion and testing ideas. And I think he would be rightly proud to think that we're still referencing his oration in 2016. Before introducing the Premier, um, I guess introducing any Premier to an audience of public servants is slightly redundant because the Premier will be many, well known to many of you here in the audience. But let me remind you briefly that the Premier is our 45th Premier of South Australia. He was elected as the member for Cheltenham in 2002 and has previously held a range of senior cabinet positions in the South Australian Government, including education, early childhood development, environment and conservation, Aboriginal affairs and reconciliation, the minister assisting the premier in cabinet business and public sector management, families and communities, housing, ageing, disability, urban development and planning, administrative services, local government and gambling, and treasury. I think that's everything, premier, I hope. Um, and with that list, I guess it could be said that the premier's experience across all those portfolios could rightly be called Garanesque. Uh, given the breadth of responsibilities he's had. And on behalf of IPA National and on behalf of all of our audience here, we're very pleased that their Premier has supporting us in this conference and he included us in the inaugural function for Open State last night. Please uh, join me in welcoming the Premier of South Australia, Jay Weatherall. Well, thank you, Penny, for that kind introduction. And can I also uh, acknowledge uh, uh, the State President of IPA, uh, Irma Ranieri, Mr George Megalogenis, today's keynote speaker, and panel members uh, from George, George's earlier session, IPA members. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd also like to acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and we acknowledge their traditional relationship with their country. Well, it's a great honour to be invited to deliver the Garan oration, and as you've heard, Sir Robert Garan was one of the pioneers, not merely of our public service, but of our system of government and model of federation. All of us, whether public servants or parliamentarians, are today operating in a robust and enduring form of government that's very much the legacy of the clear-sighted and influential uh, leadership of people like Robert Garan. Uh, this week also uh, represents uh, another important uh, context for the delivering of, of this oration. 
Adelaide is hosting the inaugural Open State Program, which is essentially a festival of ideas dedicated to exploring and improving our democracy. And of course, the IPA conference is located within a series of something like 50 events which are designed to explore this most important question. And the general theme uh, of your conference, uh, innovation through collaboration, could not be more fitting for this time and for this place. Um, and in a sense, it's a, it's a timeless idea and, and could really fit into any time and any place. It is essentially the another way of, I think, describing the challenge of democratic leadership, which I think was uh, beautifully described uh, by John Dewey, a, an American thinker, as the role of bringing into existence a public that can act in its own interest. And that's really what innovation through collaboration is, is essentially directed at. My state uh, at this time is going through a rapid and profound series of changes brought about essentially by a transformation from an old to a new economy. And the stresses and strains of this and the forces at work and the way in which they then reflect back on the political process are resonating all around the world. I think you're seeing them resonating right at the moment in uh, the US elections. I think you probably saw them resonating very powerfully in the Brexit referendum recently. And they continue to be very much a part of life here in our country. Many of the staples of economic life, the skills we need to attain, the jobs we do, the things we produce, even the countries we trade with and who becomes part of our country are all in a state of flux. Entire industries are ebbing and rising virtually before our eyes. For example, uh, South Australia's last remaining car plant Holden at Elizabeth will close its doors late in 2017. And this is profound for South Australia. Uh, this was very much a part of how we understood our identity as a car manufacturing state. Uh, indeed, up until very recently, manufacturing was the largest sector of the South Australian economy by value. And one of the most significant parts of that largest sector was car manufacturing. That all is about to change very dramatically at the end of next year. At the same time as we're seeing that, we're seeing dramatic changes uh, in the creative element of, of our economy. The renewable energy sector, which you might have noticed has been a subject of some vigorous national debate, uh, is an emerging sector. Indeed, there's a powerful uh, example at Port Augusta of this destruction and creation, all in uh, the one visual frame that is an old coal-fired power station closing at Port Augusta and in the foreground uh, a solar thermal powered uh, essentially greenhouse which grows tomatoes uh, which is the largest of its type anywhere in the world. Uh, all in the shape of one visual image in the one landscape. So it is a dynamic and an uncertain environment, especially for people and organisations that are fighting to adapt and survive in that changing environment. And this is true for, for government at the same time as it is for business, that the need to adapt and change uh, having regard to the objective circumstances. Indeed, I would argue that the institution most in need of innovation uh, is our democracy. I believe that people should have the opportunity to be more involved in the decisions that affect their lives. And I think that there is a general view that voting once every three or four years is no longer enough to satisfy people's demands for democracy. The South Australian Government have been on this pathway of reforming democracy for some time now. In fact, we published a document called Reforming Democracy, and it's based on the fundamental belief that the quality and durability of public policy will be improved through the greater involvement of citizens. Uh, it's about recalibrating the relationship between the, the state government and the citizens, rather than the relationship between expert uh, and ordinary citizen that has to accept uh, the decisions that are handed down, rather than the relationship between 
uh, state and subject, it, it's the relationship uh, between an engaged state and citizens. And what I'm talking about here when I talk about greater involvement of citizens is not the limited form of engagement that we've become familiar with, the so-called pretend consultation where everybody knows the decision has already been taken, but people are being uh, essentially informed of something uh, under the pretext of them being asked. What I'm talking about here is a deeper level of engagement, which even begins with the very question to be asked rather than the solution to the question. In fact, profoundly, the way in which the question is, is proposed can, can have a dramatic effect on the answer to be supplied. It's a level of involvement that recognises and accepts the complexities and trade-offs that are embedded in many of the issues that we face today. We're all familiar with a number of complex public policy issues that have defeated the political process. Um, what we need, I think, is reform to our democracy that permits us to accommodate complex decisions in a way in which we can, as a community, uh, reach a wise judgement. So given the scale and breadth of challenges, we need citizens. That is, citizens who demand a more regular and substantial say on important matters to the state, but also uh, citizens who are committed to accepting the responsibilities that go with, it, with that. We need a government that will institute new methods of collective decision making and collaborative problem solving. And so today's theme of innovation and collaboration are, uh, I think, a, a description in a way of, of where the reform efforts need to go in relation to our democracy. This new approach also requires something new of people. They need to behave as citizens, not as self-interested individuals. They need to place themselves in the shoe of, of decision makers to act in the public interest. And what this means is that setting aside um, passionately held opinions and going to the next step, that is considering the trade-offs. What are the real world choices that don't uh, lend themselves to simple yes, no answers? I mean, it's, it's tried to say that if you took a poll of whether people wanted improved healthcare services, you get a resounding yes. You can take a poll on saying do people want to pay uh, more taxes for increased healthcare services, you get a resounding no. Now, one could just leave things there and say, and, and as the political process tends to do at the moment, and pick the one you like the look of and say that represents the view of people. Or you could demand something more of the democracy and say, well, how do we actually grapple with those competing inconsistent matters? What is the process of working through that our democracy needs if it's going to grapple with complex questions? If we're going to translate mass opinion into public judgment. And I think we've seen many examples of um, half-performed processes which founder because we have not essentially developed the debate in its fullest sense. The debate is not mature enough to permit the political process to make a decision. Now, at some point, it, it ultimately does pass over to leaders to, to uh, government to politicians to make decisions, to fashion compromises, and that's the art of politics. But that happens at the end of a mature debate, not at the beginning of it. Uh, and it's something which I think could aptly described as engagement to the point where the community has, is um, inclined to say, well, we've had our say, now it's over to you. How do we get to that point where we've worked through a question sufficiently? The recent Brexit process in Britain, I think, demonstrated the inadequacies of uh, one approach, which is the so-called referendum-style vote, where far-reaching and complicated issues are at hand. I think most of the evidence of what happened there seems to be that what people were voting on was very much a proxy for whether to stay in Britain or not. Uh, and the real issues that were, that were really at the heart of the expression of concern for the, for the British people uh, had 
were quite collateral to whether to stay uh, in Europe or not. And so there was no mechanism, though, for the resolution of those questions. All there was was a simple yes-no answer in a referendum. And that, I think, was an example of a failed um, process. So we all agree collaboration is a valuable thing and, and should be encouraged, but what do we actually mean by collaboration in this context? As I've said, I, um, I think I like that broad definition of our democracy, bringing into existence a public that can act in its own, own interest. So what does that mean, bringing sufficient people together? Well, the first thing we need to do is, as a government to, is to collaborate amongst ourselves within government agencies, between government agencies. Um, I can remember seeing a word in my early days uh, of being a minister, the whole of government approach. And you can see it littered through bureaucratic material uh, for decades before. It's the easiest phrase to utter and the hardest phrase to implement. Uh, and in recent years, um, we've made some efforts in using various means to ensure that agencies share information, to rise up from their silos and strive for common purpose. And you would have heard from um, Ms Irma Ranieri, our Commissioner for Public Sector Employment, uh, we're seeking to do this, create this idea of one government through new codes of ethics, including public sector values, improved performance development and management systems and standardised arrangements, employment and human resources practices. We're also seeking to gain this whole of government perspective through better intra-agency or inter-agency inter collaboration, aided by publishing some overarching objectives. Uh, and two years ago, we published South Australia's economic priorities, 10 of them, documents virtually every aspect of our economic life. It serves to unite agencies behind an overarching goal, which is to be the place where people and business thrive. And those 10 economic priorities have within them sub-objectives which uh, have measurable and definable time-limited targets. And what we're inviting uh, our public servants to do is to regard that as a strategic guide for thinking and to invite people to populate it with initiatives. But of course we need more than public servants. We need um, to work with business, academia, non-government organisations and the wider community. So the next key question is how do we enable those collaborations to come about? What mechanisms can we employ to bring people together and give them a voice? And this is an area where we've also been doing a lot of work. We have a wide range of collaborative tools to hand. And I want to touch on a few of them today. The first, the 90 day project which aims to find solutions to complex problems in a set time frame. Um, and they've created um, successful outcomes, but also created uh, the opportunity to overcome inertia. Um, you would have, many of you would be aware of a problem that somebody starts working on and it gets stuck and just seems to go on forever and then somebody shifts their position or it gets lost in the mist of time and it never has an end. The 90 day project is, um, is based on the idea that if it's not sorted in 90 days, it probably is never going to be sorted. And so it gives a definable beginning and end to a project and even finding out that, that something isn't going to work and knowing that at the end of 90 days is itself an achievement. But these projects have been an important way in which we've sought to focus effort and also to engage and collaborate with a broader group of people than just the, the people affected. And I'll talk about some examples of success in that area a bit later. The further institutional arrangement we've put in place is the State Coordinator General. Essentially a former head of Premier and Cabinet, Jim Hallian, occupies that role. And his role is to unblock major development applications and also to consider unsolicited bids. So something that sits above uh, the, the current bureaucratic arrangements can reach into councils uh, and also provide guidance and support. And I'll provide uh, also some examples of where that's worked. Open plan offices, uh, just that mechanism has been a powerful impetus to removing literal and figurative barriers between people uh, within their workplaces. 
country cabinet and community cabinet meetings whereby ministers and the departmental CEOs get out of the CBD and talk to people on farms and community halls and factories at schools and in sporting clubs. It's been a powerful way of inviting people into uh, collaborative processes with government. State-of-the-art smartphone apps, including one developed by our Department of Planning, Transport and Infrastructure, that alerts drivers to traffic delays so that they can take alternative routes and other means by which we can improve service. The Your Say website, which gives people the chance to engage directly with government, and now has 53,400 registered users. The further, a series of innovation challenges, including one that will see new carbon reduction initiatives carried out in South Australia, and another which I launched yesterday that promises to unearth a new digitally enabled enterprise in the style of Air B&B. So instead of the traditional way of procuring a service, it's uh, providing a challenge uh, which is less defined in terms of precisely what we want and, and inviting uh, innovative projects to come forward. Uh, the next uh, cluster of measures are under the banner of speed and include faster decisions on low-risk procurements, streamlined consultation on development approvals, the abolition of hard copy annual reports and Simplify Day, which is about essentially getting rid of unnecessary um, and burdensome red tape. Participatory budgetary programs like Fund My Idea or Fund My Community, which allow people themselves to devise and allocate grants, so far totaling $2.5 million, projects of value to towns, suburbs and neighbourhoods. And um, finally, citizens' juries which give people the power to co-design government policies and make decisions, decisions that are often more effective and more widely accepted than if they'd been left to the political process alone. And indeed, we've used citizens' juries in cases where the political process has been unable to resolve uh, some of these questions. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've talked about the imperative to innovate through collaboration in a fast-changing world and some of the mechanisms that we've been employing in South Australia to, to deal with it. I want to give you just a few examples of the application of these approaches to real world issues. I've mentioned the 90 day projects, but to give you some of the flavour of uh, how those projects have worked, uh, I want to select three, um, three or four of them that um, are of note. Cutting to regulations which limit the growth of live music scene in Adelaide. So starting very much with the end user, rather than looking at it from the perspective of the regulator, going to the people that actually have an ambition to grow live music and asking them what the barriers are and working backwards. Um, better road transport for agriculture resulting in improved efficiency in animal welfare, in particular the last mile. Uh, all of these initiatives looked at from the perspective of the uh, experience of the person seeking to transport uh, their goods to market. Uh, it turns the process around from looking at the regulatory purpose to look at the person that actually is affected by the regulation and then backfilling obviously the public interest that's sought to be protected. Cutting red tape for the state's tuna industry, a sector that uh, is a massive contributor to our economy. Uh, but had to deal with sometimes overlapping licensing and other regulations overseen by at least two government agencies. And this was a great example of, uh, if you'd undertaken just a desktop review and you looked at the regulations themselves, it wouldn't have been of much help. It was not really the regulations that were the problem. It was the time of the year that the inspection was carried out and the fact that government agencies were doing very similar things but using parallel processes a different time of the year and the collapsing down of the process to just using the one process saved this industry at literally millions of dollars per annum. So very much looking at things from the perspective of uh, the person to be, uh, that bears the burden of the regulation. And then finally, criteria-led discharge, which allow nurses to safely discharge patients from hospitals to free up busy doctors. Now, this is a classic example of something that commenced and got stuck and then wasn't looked at for a couple of years. But the 90 day project provided a mechanism and a means by which we could build people around this idea. And we just 
tackled it until it was resolved. And this obviously has led to dramatic improvements in productivity and also improved the wellbeing of patients that were stuck in hospitals waiting simply to be signed off by a doctor when they could have been uh, released days, if not um, uh, uh, earlier. I also want to uh, touch on citizens' juries um, because they're now being employed in a way which we think is incredibly powerful. I started by saying that one of the great challenges is this question of uh, democracy, reforming democracy. I remember going to my first citizen's jury and asking one of the jurors why he had turned up. And he said uh, to me something quite profound. He said, I want to be able to tell my son that politics works. And he was there not necessarily for the issue, which was uh, essentially about uh, how we deal with alcohol fueled violence in the city. He was, he was there because he understood that there was a problem with the political process and that this is an issue that had got stuck in the legislature and he wanted to be part of helping us find a solution. So we, we have um, embarked on a number of uh, juries uh, and the most powerful though is the one that we're presently engaged in, which is deliberating on whether South Australia to take a deeper role in the nuclear fuel cycle. It's about 350 members. It's one of the largest deliberative uh, democracy processes that's ever been held anywhere in the world. Significantly, it's working through feedback gathered through the largest information and consultation program conducted in the history of the state. As part of that process, and by the end of this month, Consultation sessions would have been held at 100 sites throughout South Australia. More than 50 regional towns and remote Aboriginal communities will be visited by our consultation and response agency. More than 15,000 face-to-face conversations have been held. 30,000 community conversations have been hosted on social media platforms. And at least 42,000 people have visited our No Nuclear website to obtain facts and to find out how to get involved. Citizens' juries um, uh, are, I think, uh, an important guide to the approach we want to take more generally. What these juries do is that they're entitled to bring any expert they want to come before them. Uh, And interestingly, for an issue like nuclear power uh, and a deeper involvement in that, you would imagine it incites strong passions, and it does. But the, the process... The, the, the first thing that you note about a citizen's jury process is the civilising effect that a process of deliberation has on people's behaviour. Quite different from the public discourse that you see re, uh, projected about the political process. Uh, and people become thoughtful. The first thing that happens is that greater respect is gained for the opposite perspective because people hear it expressed in a safe environment where there is time to consider it. And of course, it it also, because it occurs over a period of time, what you see is awareness raising, uh, working through of issues, and then ultimately uh, resolution. Uh, And I think it is, people go on a very powerful journey. Sometimes people people come in with very strong, strongly held opinions that through the process become unfrozen and then Um, often they might move to a different position. They may return to their first position, but the process is a very powerful one and leads to, we believe, uh, wise guidance for our public uh, processes. Um, I also want to uh, touch on this role of the State Coordinator General, which is aimed at driving investment, cutting red tape and creating jobs. The Coordinator General, as I mentioned, uh, Jim Hallian, the former Head of Premier and Cabinet, offers case management on proposals, including retail, commercial, aged care, affordable housing, industrial projects of values more than $3 million. It also has the power to call in a project for review by the Development Assessment Commission where it's become stuck uh, in uh, perhaps local government. And in the current financial year, the Coordinator General is dealing with projects that are valued at a total of $392 million, supporting over 2,000 jobs. It has another dimension, and that is growth and development relating to unsolicited proposals. Um, And this occurs when a business or not-for-profit organisation approaches the government with a proposal that hasn't been formally requested, but involves access to government assets 
or delivery of a service to the government. Um, and what, what's been interesting about the Coordinator General process is that um, it, it's allowed somebody that sits, if you like, above the bureaucracy to, to assist and guide. Almost half of the work that the Coordinator General does is not to actually get the government or local government to change its approval processes, but to actually change the proposition because the proposition is the thing that's in need of change. But the process that we have at the moment doesn't involve an iterative or collaborative relationship with the proponent, often for probity reasons. So this provides a mechanism by which the proponent can go if almost to a third party who, to some degree, is a resolver of disputes uh, in what would otherwise be the application of regulatory or, or approval processes by government. Sometimes it's no more or less than a relatively junior person in a government agency having the confidence to make the decision they're inclined to make. And so having a senior, a very senior public servant essentially giving them some guidance or advice or support is also profound. The non-decision seems safer to some people than the yes or no decision. So this, this has become a, a very interesting and important um, area of endeavour. I also want to touch on some other forms of public sector engagement which has made um, a great difference. Uh, and that is in participatory budgeting. As part of the Fund My Community program, the, the Salisbury East Neighbourhood House in Adelaide's northern suburbs came up with a plan to establish a coffee cart business run by at-risk youth. Participants on the Fund My Community website voted for the project, a $15,000 government grant. So this is a grant process which is essentially voted on by the community. It's not chosen by a public servant. And um, this $15,000 grant was easily eclipsed by the in-kind value of the donations provided by local businesses once they heard about the project. So not only was this a project owned by the community and chosen by the community and dreamt up by the community, it, value was added to it by the community essentially because it was developed through that collaborative process. So far, the $6,000 has been raised by the new coffee cart, which has been reinvested into training and skills, paying for a dozen young people to complete certificates in hospitality, first aid, safe food handling, and occupational health and safety. The upshot is that these young people are gaining skills that count towards their high school certificate. They're being assisted to complete school or go on to further study and employment, and it's created capacity in this community which has been heavily hit by a high levels of unemployment. So all of these measures are directed at mobilising the resources that exist in the broader community. Collaboration through innovation involves us seeking to, um, rather than have governments sitting up separate from the community and providing solutions to questions that people often didn't know were being asked. It involves participating in the shaping of the questions and the description of the solutions. This, of course, um, is powerful in many ways. Uh, it helps us get it right. Um, it de-risks many of the work, much of the work we do as a government. But profoundly, it, it also uh, means that the solutions we come up with are durable and are unlikely to be picked apart uh, in, uh, down the track. We're doing this because we want to mobilise our most underutilised resource in our state. And that is the common sense judgement of everyday citizens. It does involve a recalibration of the relationship between the expert and the citizen. And, and for these purposes, our public service is an expert. Politicians are a species of expert. And experts need to be servants of uh, the community, not dictating to the community. So people are demanding this. It's not just something that, that we're doing because we think it will give us a better democracy and better outcomes. It's a demand. It's a natural demand from people. They want more of their democracy. They're more critical in their thinking. They expect more than a vote every four years. Uh, they also have this uneasy sense that the current process is not supplying the answers to the questions they want. Places like South Australia are undergoing this transformation. 
and we must find a place for ourselves in the world. And in this environment, the most important qualities we all need to develop are adaptability, an open and outward looking orientation to the world and this desire and need to collaborate. And this applies with equal force to every sector of civil society. It applies most powerfully, I believe, to our public sector. So ladies and gentlemen, I have every confidence that as we develop this more participatory form of democracy and a more responsive style of government, we'll ultimately serve our citizens best. And uh, IPA's national conference, uh, I believe, will make an important contribution to this, as I hope uh, this whole few weeks of activities under the banner of Open State. So I wish you all the best in your deliberations over the next few days and look forward to seeing you at other Open State events. Thank you. Thank you.